This debate is going to look at the question of morality, the vexed question of, uh, of morality in politics, and whether we actually want our politicians to take moral positions. Do we believe them if they do? And if they do, does morality favor the left or the right? Does history favor the left or the right? Don't all politicians think they're in the right? Don't even the most realist politicians, when challenged, defend their positions on moral grounds? On my immediate left, we have Chris Bryant, a uh, Labour MP for the Ronda. On my right, Sophie Walker, founding leader of the Women's Equality Party. Phil Collins, who you may have seen on your list, is sadly not able to join us. He's unwell today. Uh, Peter Hitchens, as you see, is very much present, uh, columnist for the Mail on Sunday. Let, let's look at the question of whether history and morality favour the left or the right. Which, which do you think it is, Chris? Uh, well, I suppose I, I, I'm an ex, uh, I used to be a vicar. I'm an ex-vicar, though the Daily Mail once described me as an ex-gay vicar, um, <laughs> which, uh, th and the gay thing is coming along quite nicely, actually, and I, in, in fact, in fact, I'm a practicing homosexual, and uh, <laughs> one day I'll probably be quite good at it, or at least my husband certainly hopes so. Um, uh, but uh, so I suppose I ought to be arguing that... Um, that uh, you know, God favours the left, and um, I, you know, I helped uh, run the Christian Socialist movement for several years. And um, but I, I, I think it's actually very dubious um, whether you come from a Christian perspective or any other to uh, presume that you have all of the moral high ground. You may have good arguments that are based on ethical considerations, but handing out uh, membership cards. Uh, for any political party to the individual members of the Holy Trinity, I think is a mistake. Um, however, my biggest anxiety at the moment is that uh, there is a version of politics which is deliberately amoral. That is to say, um, I think some people in politics at the moment around the world have decided that if you lie, at least 40% will believe you, so you might as well have those 40%, so you might as well lie. I think that is the fundamental assumption behind Donald Trump. Uh, I think it's the assumption behind, for instance, President Putin in relation to Salisbury, I, I, which I, I simply don't understand how a Russian, two Russian men who looked remarkably like a gay couple to me um, <laughs> could uh, come to Salisbury and be put off by the snow, having only just left Moscow. Um, <laughs> but I think that that was deliberate it was deliberate that nobody should believe them because that was part of putting two fingers up to Britain. Um, and I think that that is an essential part of the way that uh, Putin does his politics. I've just come back from China and um, where I was on a visit with the Foreign Affairs Committee and we met with um, a member of the Politburo, uh, you know, one of the 25 men who runs China. Um, and his whole political posture was amoral. It was just about um the economy nothing more than that and um you know we raised various other issues and he was simply not interested uh so so i would argue that you do have to have a morality i get a bit um worried about people on moral crusades uh because w if you believe in yourself too much and you don't have an element of doubt there's a danger i think that you become a demagogue the classic instance of this is um not political at all, but a friend of mine was driving me to a, uh, a by-election and I said, are you sure this is the right route? And he said, I'm 100% certain. And I, that's what worried me because when somebody's 100% <laughs> certain, it seems to me they haven't taken into consideration the possibility that they might be wrong. And those are the most dangerous people of all. So a late and he was wrong. He w it was of the wrong course, route. Of course. <laughs> So a late bid for the, for the virtues of doubt. Um, um, so I'm an Anglican after all. <laughs> <laughs> History and morality on the side of the left or the right. Okay, so I'm going to have a go at answering the question. Mm -hmm. um, Why not? That's <laughs> unusual. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so I think um, both sides often, lay, I mean always, lay claim to delivering progress. But from where I'm sitting, I suppose it's, it's a plague on both houses because both left and right, the, the morality that they present damages women's lives. And so long as we have 
uh, history books and morality lessons written by men, institutions ruled and governed by men, economic templates written to the male experience. I mean, Adam Smith is the ultimate, right? His irony-free declaration of man's uh, self-interested man while he sort of was had his meals brought by his mother. Um, uh, you know, th basically this this is this for me is the is the overarching issue, which is that both sides are bringing morality that doesn't see women. So on the right. We've got a system that prizes family values, uh, conservatism based on very narrow and quite oppressive views about what families should be, so white, middle class, heteronormative. Uh, but, you, it, but from that position, you can still support and pass laws on, for example, gay marriage, uh, because it follows views on the sanctity of marriage and a, a sort of emulation of heteronormativity, if you like. Um, and from the right, the that sort of morality allows women to thrive when they fall within conservative values. So I d this idea of a meritocracy, for example, where women can make it to be prime minister if they're, if they're just as good as men, if they try harder, they can get further. And this declaration that w you know, the right it, it does better for women because they've had two female prime ministers without sort of examining the idea that two women in, in 200 years is probably not that much of a meritocracy. Um, but on the right, it's when women fall outside of that very narrow vision of morality uh, that women are punished. So two-child limit on ta child tax credit. Perfect example of punishing families that don't meet conservative values. It's black and Asian families the hardest. Ronnie Mead Trust, I think, yes, in the Women's Budget Group, show that the combination of cuts and changes to universal credit would hit black women the most, leaving the £5,000 worth off a year on average. Uh, now, it's interesting because I think then this strong moral attachment to family values does mean that the right can pass useful uh, legislation that recognises, for example, violence against women and girls, criminalising um, female genital mutilation, revenge porn, the bringing of the domestic abuse bill, but only because that violence is seen as egregious to the morality of family and as anomalous episodes rather than as a result of structural inequality that women experience. And that's why the forthcoming domestic violence bill is so slim, which is a huge disappointment uh, coming from Theresa May's government. I, what is good about it is that it makes abuse in front of children an, an aggravating factor. It strengthens family law courts. But there is no funding, additional funding, ring-fenced funding, protected, sustainable, sufficient funding for the services run by and for women living with and escaping from male violence. And of course, the right has presided over austerity that has made uh, poor women even poorer, disproportionately being paid for by women, 86% of it has been paid by women. Now, on the left, of course, we have, uh, as Jeremy uh, uh, JC was saying yesterday, um, the left is the party of women, the left is the party of equality. Uh, I disagree fundamentally with this because the left has a structural analysis and a morality that is limited very much to class. And particularly in this latest incarnation, can't see any oppression that's not Western and capitalist. And that is why in the past, for example, men on the left have condoned FGM as a cultural practice because they don't see the oppression of black and Asian women by black and Asian men. It doesn't fit into their structural class analysis. Um, the left is obsessed with working class men's jobs. Jeremy Corbyn's tour this summer, the, his Made in Britain Brexit plan that affirms his 50-year focus on manufacturing, which is frankly a slap in the face to millions of women who are uh, disproportionately employed in service sector. Uh, do you know what, how, how the Treasury classifies uh, a woman, a mother raising two children and caring for an, el an elderly parent? Economically unproductive. Economically inactive. <laughs> inactive. <laughs> uh, and the left doesn't have an answer to that because it, it, it ignores the vast amount of work, unpaid and low paid, uh, care work that uh, women do. Uh, and I think, you know, if we're going to talk about morality of equality, we need, I would expect Labour not just to want to nationalise everything from railways to water to energy to Royal Mail, but actually to do something about social care, which has an 80% female workforce and is absolutely on its knees. So, yeah, I mean, the centre-left has made some progress, particularly on representation. Uh, but in the 2015 e election, it was a huge uh, disappointment to me to see the left did not make a case against austerity, despite it being evident at that point that women were disproportionately paying for it. Um, it just bargained with itself over how much more of it we could take. Thank you. It is your turn. Right. A plague on both our houses, yeah. and, and uh, does history and morality favour the left yeah. or the right? I, Chris is an ex-vicar. Uh, I'm an ex-Trotskyist. 
and when I was a Trotskyist, of course, I had no morals at all. Please join me in thanking uh, Sophie Walker, Chris Bynes, and Peter Hitchens. <laughs>